We've seen so many partner changes this week, haven't we? It's really exciting because, you know, there's obviously pairs that are breaking up, but then you're going to see new pairs forming which haven't played together before, and that's always really exciting to see how they will develop. So that's what we'll discuss today. In this week's podcast, we're going to discuss what we've been doing for training or what I've been doing for training leading up to the World Championships in Dubai in a few weeks' time. We're also going to discuss a really interesting topic of all these pair changes. We're seeing this World Paddle Tour, men's and women's, lots of pairs, you know, splitting up and, and who they're deciding to play with. So I think let's discuss those pairs and also, you know, the, the, the decisions around why you would change pair and, and how you would select a new partner. And then as always, at the end, let's answer some of our community's questions. So it's a few weeks to go, isn't it, until Dubai? You've been training this week, getting ready for it. I mean, I'm excited about it from from a, a playing perspective, but also to see it. Um, obviously, before my role in Dubai, I was really close to the UAE Federation, and um, you know, I was their technical advisor for seven or eight years. And so, so obviously, like now they're holding that event. Yeah, they're discussing with me. They're, they're, they're you know, it's going to be an, an incredible event. You know, they, they are really wanting to a show Qatar how, <laughs> what they can do, but also be like, you know, put their stamp on on the world of paddle. And and, you know, Dubai is is well known for those events. So it's going to be really exciting to see, you know, that event. And it will all be live streamed. So you know, anyone wanting to watch can can see the event. Um, but then also, yeah, playing. I, I mean, that's you know, competing there. It's going to be some really tough matches and uh, yeah, I just, I'm hoping to be as ready as I can be uh, given the, the current situation. It's like a second home for you out there, isn't it? It's funny, you've been there so long, what, it about is, 10 years? Yeah, it's... I was there for 10 years and and, and I, I really, I mean, I love the, the, the people there, the Emiratis, they're, they're, they're genuinely lovely people and, um, you know, they're very welcoming, they're very, you know, kind of genuine and, and supportive and they, they, they love paddle and so... You know, going back there, it would be really nice. Um, you know, all of the clubs, I know the majority of the, the people involved in the clubs. And um, yeah, I, I, I love it, to be fair. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice atmosphere, a nice paddle community. So I'll definitely enjoy that part of it, for sure. Yeah, you had the qualifying up in Derby on home soil. And now you're going over for yeah. the main event on pretty much home soil as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it does feel like home soil. But yeah, I mean, it's going to be exciting because... When I first started with the Federation, the UAE Federation, one of the, one of the kind of tasks I, I was focusing on was um, these international events. And so we hosted the 2015 <clears throat> World Paddle Tour Masters and we did that at NAS where I was working. And um, then we held, you know, several FIP events. And I always wanted to hold an event at the Aviation Club, which is where the tennis, the, the, the Dubai ATP event is. And I really wanted to do that. And, and I pushed quite hard for that at the beginning. And they just, you know, it, they just weren't ready for it. They weren't, you know, it just wasn't big enough in the country. And now this is where they're holding the World Championships. So uh, for me, it has always been the best venue there. Um, you know, the stadiums are set up for it. There's a, a kind of Irish village and, and, and restaurants and everything around that. And, and I think it will be a fantastic, you know, it will be yeah, a fantastic event. So um, I'm looking forward, definitely looking forward to that. I... I, I would wish that I could have a little bit more uh, match practice and tournament practice before going. And, you know, this is one of the things with the UK being at such a an early stage in development is we just, you know, we just don't have really, really strong competition over here. And and so, you know, I'm hoping to, to spend a couple of days or a day or two before the event, just getting my match competition up and, and getting a bit more comfortable. We talked about last time the importance of communication with the team. Like you said, we don't we don't have the courts here, so it's difficult for the team to come together. What do you do like in these weeks now? Do you how do you kind of keep keep in contact? It's so important, isn't it? Do you have like a I imagine like a WhatsApp group or something that just gets you guys chatting? Yeah, and... we have a, a WhatsApp group, and and between tournaments, you know, obviously during the the event, like during Derby, it was you know very much for organisation, and now it's a little bit for <laughs> just a bit of banter. Probably. Yeah, it's a bit of banter, really. It's a bit of a joke. It's it's you know just to keep in touch with everyone and and, and what they're doing, and you know the ones in the UK, which there are one or two, um, you know we try and and meet up and and play a little bit and train a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the real work will be, again, once we go there in person together as a team. And this is why the one in the UK was so good, because we were able to do that for a few days before. Hopefully we can do the same again here. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's just kind of keeping in touch. And, and from my own personal side, it's kind of keeping fit and, and you know, making sure that I'm just doing everything I can off court to, to, to be ready. Because, you know, for me personally, I'm not going to be changing the technique on my Van Decker or doing anything like that. It's, it's more a question of, right, you know, we've got a week full of paddle. I don't want to get injured and I want to make sure that I can play at my highest level for as long as possible during that match. So, um, you know, it's it's more physical focus for me anyway. It's been a real buzz, isn't it, about after, since after the, the qualifying at Derby, at least in the UK, there's been mm. a bit more of a buzz around paddle, isn't there? Like you see it on, on social media, but you also just speaking to people, you know, the awareness, the awareness grows. I mean, it's well, well established, you know, mm. in, in the Middle East, in Dubai already, but awesome yeah. for promotion over there right the, the whole yeah year. definitely and 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 it, it's great the thing is we're now with social media and and look you know <laughs> it's what we're doing right social media so so we know that this field well but one of the uh, things about social media is is so many people you can communicate to the world with a with a photo or with a video and and you hold that event like in derby and and suddenly you know it's in the, the uk newspapers and and people are promoting it on linkedin and people are finding out about it and you know interest is growing and so and all of the countries started like this i remember when the uae was like this it only had one or two you know two clubs and that that momentum that that came from a few celebrities playing and and you know obviously the shape playing and you know the newspapers covering it and it just grew you know it grew and grew and hopefully that's what will happen here in the UK and I think you know it's going to be really good also for Dubai to to host this you know now they're at about 500 courts which is a lot really for for their size um, and you know they're going to have you know the world spectacle of paddle. In their city so fantastic for any of those players that are going to be able to to go and watch and knowing knowing them knowing dubai sports council and the federation i'm sure they will make it really accessible for for anyone that does want to to watch so this week we're seeing a lot of pairs making changes naturally it's going to happen isn't it changing pairs mm. but you know anything particular about this this period or the, the pairs that we're seeing that is there's quite interesting i think a lot of interesting new pairs are going to be formed from this some really exciting new pairs and i think before we before we talk about which pairs are splitting and which ones are playing together it, it's also worth saying that at the world paddle tour level you're talking you know the top 20 or 30 players in the world so they don't have a lot of choice if they want to change partner if another pair is not going to split it's not like at the recreational level where you go and play at a club and you say, oh, this is not working for me. I'll go and find someone else to play with. And there's several other people that they could play with. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So, you know, when a pair sp splits at the top level, they need another pair to split for one of their good players to be available. So, so what we often see is, you know, instead of just one pair, we might occasionally see two pairs and, and then they switch partners. But, but, what we will see now is several pairs split because then they're all doing mixed match to find to find their partner and that's it's it's exciting because you know you're used to week in week out seeing the same pairs play and you know when you make these changes you in in your mind you're thinking god will they fit well together and you're thinking of their games primarily and you're thinking god he's got such an aggressive left court game and what a fantastic right court game you know if they play together they're going to be a fantastic pair but it doesn't always work like that it's it's so much to do with you know the personality and and the gelling and you know if before we talk about you know who is playing with who the reason that they split is is generally down to the personality it's not you know like take Paquito and Martin Deneno you know separating I mean they they just had a fantastic tournament they won the tournament and and it's it's rare to see that the final both pairs are splitting up. Both of those pairs are probably playing the best paddle that they're playing. You've got Bella and Cuello and you've got Martin Zanello and, and, and Paquito and you're thinking, why are those two pairs splitting? But it's 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 the, the kind of the personality and, and and you know and feeling in sync and, and there's just so much that goes into that because when they're playing together they're, they're, they're spending day in, day out together. They're training together. They're going to the tournament together. You know, it, it's it's a lot of time. It, I mean, it is a relationship. It's a relationship, you know, with with your partner. You know, they're, they're, they're thinking that, you know, the season might go from March or early March until December. You're, you're spending every week with that person. So it's often the personality 
and the emotional side that is the reason that these pairs are, are deciding to go separate ways. Which also, also makes it quite difficult, I suppose, when you start a new pair is so much of that is personality, which you, you, you can't, well, you can get on with someone, but I suppose until you're actually playing with them, you know, you, you, you don't know, do you? Mm. So that's, that's exciting as well. Well, and way. I think this is where, you know, the recommendation we always give to players is find someone you enjoy playing with. You know, if you enjoy playing with them, you will play your best paddle. And, and you know, this is, this is what makes this really interesting because, you know, at the moment in the World Paddle Tour, we've gone, you know, coming out of an amateur sport, it's, it's essentially a big group of friends. And, and most of them are, are really good friends off court. You know, they, they, they've, they, they've, been, they've grown up together, whether it's Argentina or Spain. And, you know, they're, they're in, you know, a very kind of close group. Mm. But being a friend off court is not necessarily being a friend on court. And, and, you know, you take LeBron and Galan, who aren't splitting. Well, not that we know of. But, you know, LeBron off court, the way he would speak to, to Galan is very different to how he speaks to him on court. And, and you know, in Galan's personality or in his situation, he can take that on court, whereas another player would get really, really frustrated. So, and, you know, you never really know the full extent of of why this has happened. You know, like Paquito and Martin, you know, there's been comments that Martin, um, you know, wants a different kind of mentality from Paquito and, and, and he's maybe a little bit more serious, a little bit more, you know, kind of focused and Paquito is slightly more laid back. And, and so over time, as a pair, they've just kind of grown in different directions. And, and you know, that's, that's all, it, all it takes, really. Um, and so added to the fact that maybe you're not getting your best results, not talking about that pair, obviously, because they just won <laughs> yeah. last week, but, but generally speaking, you know, not getting the results puts a little bit of pressure on, on the partnership as well. And, and so, you know, you start to see cracks and you see other pairs doing really well. And so, you know, I, I suppose a part of it also is the grass is always greener, isn't it? You know, and, and um, yeah, that mentality that I, I could do better with someone else. And, and, and sometimes people just want to change as well. Right. Yeah. I suppose, you know, if you've been playing with someone for a long time, yeah. maybe you think, actually, you're sort of both ready for a change. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, and absolutely. And, and, you know, players will start the season thinking, right, I'm going to play with this pair. I'm expecting that there, there's, there'll be an internal pressure, but I'm sure there'll be a, an external pressure as well. We're expecting to see results by this stage, for example. And and if you don't, then then it's like, right, well, you know, do we go internally and we really work this out and we drive together and we, you know, we fight together or do we, do we separate? And so if we looked at the pairs now, you know, for me, the biggest shock of, of the separation um, is between Chingotto and Teo. I mean, they have played together since they were, were kids and they've gone through those good times, the bad times that, you know, they've, they, they've, they've grown as a pair, like incredibly. Um, and, and they've, just reach the point where you know they feel like a separation will will be good and you know if you look at that separation now Chingotto is going to play with Garrido and Garrido split from Campagnolo and and so you've got that Chingotto um Chingotto Garrido together and Teo is going to play with Paquito which will be interesting because obviously one of them is going to have to play on the right hand yeah. side um and so you know, and Campagnolo now is is obviously separated from Guerrillo and he's he's playing um, with Sands. And so, you know, loads and loads of new pairs <laughs> are coming out of this. And it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And, and there is talk. And, and right now we're saying these pairs have split and they're playing together, but there's no hard and fast rule. It's not like a a transfer window in football that there's a date you have to say it by and and then you're you're fixed like you know this may change again you know you never know and you know there's talk of Sanyo separating with Tapia which is you know really exciting pair and, and Tapia then playing with Coelho who is obviously split with Bella um and and so it's it, yeah it, it's it, it's going to be really exciting to see how these pairs you know like when all the pieces rest who's playing with who and and then how they will work together and you've seen some interesting splits in in the women's as well like Marta Morero she's splitting with Lucia Sands and you're also going to see uh, Delphi Bria splitting with Tamara Icardo who um you know previously had a, a really good season or end of season and so um you know again it's like mixing and match it's almost like Tetris finding the right piece that works for you um you know when when you see so many separations and we probably might see 
like these separations, but then almost like secondary separations, you think, where people split, they realise it doesn't quite work, and then maybe even they, they form other, other pairs. It's Yeah, and, and we're, we're quite late on in the season, you know, like it, it's, it's mid-October, so, so really there's, there's a couple of months left. So, you know, this is almost, I think, probably a bit of a taster at, at this point to say, right, let's see how the end of this season goes, you know, with the view to going into off-season and, and then, you know, into the future. And you never, you never really know until you've played with them and you've played some matches and you, you, you're seeing, seeing how it's going. Um, and, and it can take time. Some, some pairs will click instantly and others will, will take a little bit of time. Number one thing that makes a great pair? Um, if there was? I mean, you know, now we've got so many talented players in the game. And I, I think, you know... <sighs> Talent and shots and, and the, the synchronization of those shots is one thing. Um, but also the same, you know, on the same side, the the kind of mentality and, and um, you know, competitiveness. And, um, you know, then, the, then you've got communication and, and it's really difficult because, if you, you know, if you looked at LeBron and Galan as an example and you said, you know, would you want to copy their communication? Probably not. And, um, you know, would you want, you know, LeBron, incredibly talented, um, but, but you probably wouldn't copy his mental approach. Whereas, you know, someone like a, a Bella is, you know, a hard worker, a great tactician, um, great understanding of the game, not as talented. And, and so it's, it's finding, you know, your jigsaw piece that fits with you. And, and Bella was working really well with Cuello, you know, a really, uh, you know, a tall lefty, great reach, played, you know, his style of game, allowed Bella to play his style of game. And sometimes you'll see, you know, like Sanyo and Bella, for example, I thought, oh God, that's gonna be a fantastic pair. But actually it just didn't quite gel. It just yeah. didn't quite mix. And so you've got to, you know, it, it's a bit of luck as well. You've got to just find that, that right combination, really. It sounds so simple as well, but just enjoying playing with that person isn't it mm. when it comes down to it if, if you enjoy it even at any level I think if you enjoy playing with the person you're with your level will yeah will just keep going and yeah and and definitely uh, you know at the recreational level like or, or or really up till that point you know for the world paddle tour guys it's slightly more difficult because they don't have a lot of choice but but below that level the enjoyment factor is is huge um you know and, and playing with the person for enjoyment is the primary reason really you know your personalities mix well together you communicate you feel comfortable communicating if ever there's a time that you feel pressure or you can't communicate or you know they're bossing you around or whatever it might be then that's when you know again cracks start to show and you you, you make those choices but um yeah the enjoyment factor is is key so this week's video is on the continental grip changing that uh, on the vibra uh, mm -hmm. you work with g mm -hmm. It's quite a tough shot, isn't it, the Vibra, for, particularly for beginners to learn. It's one of, one of the shots that, at least I find with a lot of my students, really is, is tricky. Tricky for them to, to get the feeling on, on really hitting a good Vibra. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, in that video, um, and, and, you know, I'd say that, that G is a kind of inv an intermediate to advanced. Like, she, she's played for a lot of years, and, and she plays really well. Like, she hits her bandeja really well, and it's... At that stage, the trying to change to the continental grip for your overheads, and and you'll remember this in paddle and in tennis, and it, it's it's that that whole thing of you know being able to to pronate your wrist to control the racket face, as opposed to you know moving the grip in your hand and, and hitting like that. And this is one of the things with paddle that that you know I've discovered along the way is that if we change that grip you know, at the time that G was learning, you know, when she was learning the sport, if we can change all of the technique at the beginning, it's so much easier, rather than having developed this habit, which she wasn't even aware of, and then you're trying to implement change and you're trying to change a habit that's built up over years. And it's it's really difficult, this, and, and you know, I'm always emphasizing the importance of doing lessons at the beginning, but but just that feeling of, of changing the grip, because what often happens with the coach, and I'm sure you've had this as well, where you change the grip and, and then they come and they really brush around the side of the ball, but they lose control because they're just not used to it yet. And so, yeah, that that is, you know, a hurdle for, for people is getting that. Particularly with pronation, right? Is that 
to consciously understand what you're trying to do, it's such a fine movement, isn't it? Mm. That, you know, to sort of, to slow it down and think I'm going to pronate on this, it really is a feeling thing, isn't it? Because you can't consciously, and I've had that before where, you know, you try and teach people how to pronate and they get it. They're like, oh, okay, I need to move my wrist like this. But mm. to actually do that and to consciously think about it, that sort of consciousness mm. of trying to do it really slows it down and, and you, you can't get it. It is definitely a feel thing. Like you said, when you first start, if you can just get that feeling of what it feels like, you don't mm. really want to think about, right, I need to pronate. It's good to know that you need to do that. But if you can get the feeling of that, mm. then that's a lot better, isn't it? Than trying to consciously think about pronating each time. Yeah, and I, I think um, th this is where paddle is so different to tennis because yes, the tennis serve is complicated, but really with a tennis serve, you're getting them to pronate for a flattish contact. But in paddle, because the court is smaller, you're closer to your opponents and you've got more angles with that shot, you're actually using your wrist for that pronation or supination to control where the ball goes. And, and if you hit a shot like this and, and the racket face changes ever so slightly, the result changes quite significantly on the court. And so, you know, in, in that lesson with G, we were getting that pronation mainly for her to feel the idea of moving her wrist to control her racket face. And, and so now, you know, if she can do it this way, then she should be able to, to do it. And you could see even in that lesson, she was just starting to get the idea of coming round the ball, the idea that in the continental grip, you can control the wrist. Whereas if you're not, if you're in that flat kind of, you know, smash grip that a lot of beginners use, you can't come round the ball. It's really uncomfortable with the wrist. And so it's, it's almost just understanding that and understanding that your racket face uh, it is controlled by your wrist and that dictates the direction of your shot and yeah it's repetition right at the end of the day you and i when we wanted to you know perfect our vibra we we did baskets of vibras and and that's what players need to do once they've got the overall picture of the technique but it goes back to the importance of technique doesn't it when you first start because mm. i think with paddle you know, it is so easy to pick up a racket and get playing and, and people can really keep playing without lessons, can't they, for a long time. And then they get to a point where perhaps they haven't picked up the foundations. And like you said, it's, it's then it's difficult. You're almost having to start correcting those bad habits, which is actually more difficult than yeah. starting off. Well, I mean, this is this is exactly the reason that we're building now quite a, a complex online <laughs> website, right? Like, you know, one where a player can follow their journey and they've got a path, you know, because what often happens is they play for ages, you know, they really struggle with a the shot, they type into YouTube, you know, Bandeka, and hopefully the Paddle yeah. School videos come up. <laughs> there's, there's your face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, and then when they do, they say, all right, look at those tips. Okay, next time I play, I'm going to think about that. But the problem is, is that's not, um, you know, that might not be necessarily where they need to learn in the journey. You know, like take that lesson with Vibra, you know, with um, G about the Vibra, for example. If I'd said, right, let's increase power on your Vibra and get more spin, but we didn't fix this issue with the grip, then then you will be always be limited. And so, so this is, you know, this is where these, these kind of checkpoints on your journey and and following the journey to improve your specific level is really important and you know obviously youtube great resource but you need something a little bit more customized and, and something that's a bit more personal to to you and your technique so should we go into the questions this week let's do it so question one it's about pairs so uh good topic i'm not the right fit with my current partner should i look for a new partner or keep pursuing it with my current one and try to improve it? I mean, I think the, the first thing is, you know, if, if you feel comfortable with your partner, and like we said before, your personality, you, you know, you like your partner, I think the first step is, is having a bit of a conversation. Just have a chat. And, and maybe they're in the same position. They're feeling like they can't talk and maybe you just needed to have a bit of a chat about it and, and communicate and say, you know, open the floor essentially because... That could solve your problems. Whereas if you just jump to a new partner and you have the same approach, then you may end up having the same problem with that new partner as well. Yeah, it really depends what the issue is, isn't it? If it's mm. a tactical on-court thing, it's probably something you can you can talk through and you know maybe, maybe sort of work work around. But I suppose if it's if it's something more personal, I, I suppose it, it, it's harder, isn't it, to 
It's difficult. It's it's like a relationship, yeah. isn't it? You know, you 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 know, do you make that decision that you are going to pursue it and 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 work at it, or do you feel like there are some fundamental building blocks that that are not in place, and therefore you know it's not worth your time to to work on that partnership and you have that conversation you say look i just you know this <laughs> this isn't working as a as a, a pet you know a pair on court um i think we should maybe try playing with other partners have you ever had that conversation yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it, it's it was it was difficult for me in dubai because there weren't a lot of good players and um you know my, my partner there javi I, I worked with him and so um even though i think had we had loads of players at our level, we probably would have played with different players and different partnerships. Um, but as it was, we you know it was a bit difficult to do that. Um, but then coming with the British team, you know that's exactly how it works. Is you know we have the the conversation with our you know our team coach or captain or whoever it might be, and say you know how do you feel with that that partner? Is that a good feeling? Like do you feel? as a partnership that you're pretty strong and, and when things get tight in the third set at four all, you know, are, are you as a pair going to be strong? Um, and, and that, that is under pressure is when you know, like when you know if that, that partnership, you know, you gel well together. It's almost easier in a team competition, isn't it in a way, because you're sort of assessing the, the fit for that competition. You're like, you know, is, is this a good fit for, for that match? Whereas I think if you're play, if you played with someone week in, week out at yeah. your local tournaments, then it's probably a bit, bit harder isn't it to it is it is more difficult and also because you're the one personally having that conversation yeah. it's easier in our team because it's the, the the coach or the team captain or whoever it might be is saying hey i think you as a pair would be better off with you whereas when it's you know if you or i are playing together and we say right and um, actually i don't think we want you know i don't want to play with you anymore like people take that personally you know and, and when they shouldn't it's just you know it's a game and and it, it should be you know, brought around in a, in a diplomatic way. Um, but yeah, that, that conversation, again, it needs to be had. Otherwise, you end up playing with them and, and kind of resenting your time on court, which is, you know, the last thing that you want to happen. So question two. Yeah. I find my understanding of the game is increasing, but I can't seem to apply those learning in, learnings in games. Any tips? Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, we, we have this a lot, don't we? In our community, um, you know, in our court sessions, and I would say, you know, in this case, is it a case of you have a good understanding of theory? So, so you've watched matches, you've consumed content, you understand the theory, and then you are trying to put that into a match. Or do you understand the theory, are training the theory, you know, maybe once or twice a week, you're physically training those shots. And then even though you can do it in training, you find it then difficult to do in a match. Because I feel like if you're not doing the training, then that's your big problem. You know, because there's, it's no good understanding the theory and then trying to implement it in a game. You need to practice, particularly as your level increases, there needs to be more and more training, more and more practice. And that will not only make you better at whatever it is you're trying to work on, but it also give you confidence. We talked about last week, didn't we, with the video analysis and how important mm. that is, because mm. we see this a lot with players, don't they? They say, yeah, you know, I've been training, it, I've been training it. And then you're watching their games and, and you know, what's happening is, is not what they think. So again, it comes in, doesn't it? Important yeah, and, and when we do our, our online coaching with players, we, you know, we'll say, right, I'm, I'm really working on my Chiquita first, then my lob. And I say, okay, great, let's see your training. And then they'll show me a match. And, you know, in a set, for example, the opportunity to hit Chiquita and then, you know, a lob that next ball, they might do it five times in the whole set. And and I'll say, well, that, that's not training. Training is you with a, a practice partner or training partner at the other side of the court and doing, you know, like one down, one up and doing, you know, 50 repetitions with a basket and, and making it, you know, that's training for me. Um, and, and as you increase in level, the more training you need. At a beginner level, it, you're out there having fun. You're just trying to learn a bit about the game. But if you want to progress, you need those trainings. You need, need those exercises, need to build that confidence. How important is separating the outcome from the process when it comes to this? Because even then, like you said, it's, I can imagine a lot of people take this into games. And like we said, you know, it's, it's fine to play games as a trainee if you're not playing that much. But you almost have to separate the outcome, don't you, in those games and focus on the training, which I think a lot of players probably struggle with. They get into a game, they want to win. And, and everything goes out the window. Yeah, and I think it's also difficult because most people are not doing the trainings. So, so if you're not doing the training, 
for you to play a match and to say, I'm only going to focus on the process. And when we're talking about process, we're talking about, you know, your action of, of coming under the ball and, and, you know, the direction of your shot, for example, as opposed to the outcome, which is what happens to the ball. It's very difficult to only focus on process in a, in a competitive situation. And that's exactly why you need the training is, is to work on that process so that when you come to a match, you feel comfortable about the process and now you're focusing on the outcome. And distinguishing between those and uh, you know and again it's like training i'm trying to think of you know competitive people i think you're yeah have you ever been able to focus on just the process in a in yeah, a game? But, yeah <laughs> but yeah and it's difficult isn't it because i like and the same with you you're you're equally competitive but well it, well, it starts off you start it off with the, with the process i think yeah but and but, then you, but i think the yeah. thing is is you and i've always trained yeah. you know like like we we've never I, I don't think i've ever well maybe in a completely separate sport but never in tennis or in paddle have I thought, you know what, I'm just going to play matches. You know, yeah. like as kids, we, you know, we had lessons from the age of six, seven, eight in tennis, you know, and, and even in paddle, you know, the first thing that we did on the court with you, and it was the same with me, is like, right, let's, let's understand this game by training and, and, and doing that. But neither of us went in that journey where it's like, right, let's take up the sport with four friends and just play recreational games every single time we're on court for years. Whereas that is the majority, that's what the majority of people do. Um, and so, but that's, yeah. That's partly how difficult the sport is. Like for example, tennis, I'm thinking golf as well. You really need that technique. So yeah. you almost can't, you can't jump on a court and get yeah. playing matches, can you? So it's, it's part of the, uh, the attraction of paddle, isn't it? That you, yeah. you, don't, you don't necessarily need those lessons. And it's, it's great for you learning the game and it's difficult for the coach. Because, yeah. you know, the coach now is getting players when they've already been playing for a year. Well, you'd never have that in tennis, you know. And so it's, it's, it's finding that, that way of, you know, and, and how many times are we saying, you know, please get lessons when you're, you're learning at the beginning. And the, the comment is, I don't need them. I'm improving. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fine. Which you would be. But I think it's the rate of improvement, isn't it? It's how, yeah. how quickly do you want to yeah, improve and you're going to plateau. Exactly. It's yeah. the plateau. You might be improving, but you're going to reach a point where your technique will stop you. And But if you take lessons at the beginning, you'll be able to, to, to go further up. Yes, at some point you will plateau based on you know the physicality and, and, and technique and things like that. But, but you will go at a faster rate and you will reach a higher point. But it's just persuading people to do those lessons early enough. Good stuff. Sandy, another week of training ahead oh, of you, I think. Yeah, yeah. Get back in that gym. I'd rather be on a paddle court, if I'm honest. But, yeah. you know, the pulley machine does the job for the moment, <laughs> doesn't it? You know, keep those shoulders strong. Yeah, no, it's good. It's um, another couple of weeks and you'll, you'll be out in Dubai enjoying a bit of winter sun out there. I know, I know. Can't yeah. wait. Back on home soil. <laughs> exactly, back on home soil. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. It was, a, it was fun to do, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, if you've got any questions, pop them in the comments. We'll, we'll put this on YouTube as a video. So yeah, pop them down in the comments and uh, make sure you follow and subscribe our podcast as well. Mm -hmm.